For 25 years, I've worked in the child welfare system, first in Ghana and now here in the United States. And of the many cases that I've been part of, there's one that stuck with me. A 14-year-old who watched his older brother get shot and killed during what was reported to be a gang-related activity. I met him three, four months after the incident, but he was still in a state of shock, as if the trauma had just happened. I could see in his eyes the anger, the frustration, as if he was stuck in this wordless motion that he was finding a way to express. He was struggled in school, getting into fights, all normal trauma responses. He had been diagnosed with all the trauma and mental health diagnoses you could think of, PTSD, ADHD, ODOD. And in cases like this, the standard cost of treatment is twofold, talk therapy, medication. And they are great. I'm not here to condemn that. Medications have side effects, and we know that talk therapy has its limitations. I often get calls from therapists who are working with children asking, a child is it's not able to process their trauma. What do I do? They are stuck. So that's when I start to wonder, is there another way to help children and adults who have experienced traumatic stresses process their trauma when they don't have the words for it? For thousands of years, communities around the world have developed their own traditional rituals and healing practices, and they've handed it down from generation to generation, just like where I'm from. In parts of Australia, Aboriginal healers known as Ingakaris actually use massage to suit physical and mental pain. In India and Nepal, the Ayurvedic practitioners, they use food as medicine that we take for granted. And in Ghana, West Africa, where I was brought up, we have traditional herbalists and spiritualists who also can put together herbs and concussion and make a person feel whole again. And actually, as a child, I witnessed a man who claimed to have had his spirit taken over by a powerful entity get healed simply by listening to traditional dramas play, sing, and dance while they surrounded him. It was incredible. But you know, colonial legacy would have us believe that somehow traditional rituals and indigenous healing practices are not effective, um, simply because they've not been scientifically proven by a white man or a white woman. But so are the many practices we take for granted today, right? I mean, decades ago, yoga and meditations were considered a no-go. No, let's not even go there until scientists put together a body of evidence to prove its effectiveness. Now they are mainstream. I mean, walk through downtown Denver and you see men and women with their yoga mat going to a studio, right? The lesson to me is very clear. At least Western scientists should spend time to investigate traditional rituals and beliefs and practices, especially when this practice sits at the intercession of a person's culture, their beliefs, their spirituality, and everything that makes them whole. So, in 2016, I set out to do just that. To search for the burning questions that I've been asking. Is there a science behind the rituals and traditions that I grew up with as a child back home in Ghana? And I'll share some of my favorite memories with you. As a child, some of my favorite memories were spending my summertime with my maternal grandpa, Kojo. May his soul rest in peace. And I remember that every Friday, community members came together in celebration, in drumming, and singing, and dancing, 
and, and pouring drinks to thank our ancestors and asking for rejuvenation. And, and, and as a curious child, I'll ask grandpa, what are they doing? Why are they dancing barefooted? Why are the drums tilted in a certain angle? And he will say, grandson, you know, we are giving our tiredness, our burdens, and our weariness, we are giving it to Asasiya, the goddess Mother Earth. And we are asking for rejuvenation. And I'll say, Grandpa, how is that happening? Just through a simple drumming and dancing. And he will point a drum to me and say, you see the drum there? It's made of wood from Mother Earth. Now, the skin of the animal that we play and beat on, the blood has returned to Mother Earth. So when we dance and we play and we sing, we are simply connecting back to the source of all life, Mother Earth. I became so fascinated by the energy, this rituals, and simply playing drumming conjured. So I said, Grandpa, you know what? You better teach me how to do this. So my grandpa will go ahead and teach me a simple rhythmic pattern, the bass tone slap. And I was like, Grandpa, is that all? And he said, no. When you are able to learn this, you can put together any emotions, any feelings at all you want. And so as I master it, I said, you're right. When I'm happy, I can play that when I'm sad. I can express that. And I was just fascinated by it. And so at the end of my first year as an adjunct professor at the University of Denver Graduate School of Social Work, I submitted a research proposal to our Office of Teaching and Learning titled Building Resilience Through Self-Expression, The Power of Traditional African Drums Rhythm to Heal and Relieve Stress. So I'll go ahead and recruit 100 second year graduate students who are already in my trauma class. And with the support from a research colleague, Dr. Christina Pegoya, we developed a pre and post survey because we wanted to assess their traumatic symptoms before and after the drumming experience. And for majority of the students who participated in this research, some have never even seen a djembe before. It was their first experience. So I taught them the simple rhythmic pattern. The bass tone slap. Boom, boom, pa. Boom, boom, pa. Boom, boom, pa. Boom, boom, pa. And as they played and they got really comfortable with it, I asked them, pay attention to the physiological changes that is happening in your body. Your heart rate, your energy level, your connectivity, even with the participant, and they kept playing. And so then we did a group exercise. And I said, has anybody ever had emotions and feelings where you felt like you were trapped and couldn't express it, couldn't let it out? This is the chance for you to do that. So Don, this is how Don is feeling right now. Amy, do you have any emotions you want to share? What about you, Marco? Can you add to that, emotions? And sometimes when, when they, they, they got together and, and the research went on, I could feel the group just sinking in rhythm and just playing together without even words. And so they would start playing a rhythmic sing tone. Whatever they was feeling as a group, they started expressing it. And they kept playing. And they kept playing. And as they played, you could see them engaging the four quadrants of their brain. You could see that they were connecting to each other. 
And that is what a colleague, Professor Arthur Jones, said. You know what? It's a communal processing of communication and healing. And at the end of the experience, 90% of the participants reported a significant increase in their energy level. Some even said, you know what? We feel very confident right now because we've been able to master a new skill. Some said, you know what, when I went home, I was able to connect better with my partner. We communicated better. 90%. Now, that is a remarkable result. And a really important contribution to this growing body of work. In the last two decades, scientists and researchers, neurologists have put together dozens of papers to show the efficacy of traditional African drumming and its effectiveness to heal traumatic stress. Dr. Barry Bitmore, in his study in 2001, concluded, said, for when our hands connect with a drum, that vibrates with our energy, vitality, emotions, exhilaration, in sharing and in giving and in unity and in hope, we become whole again. Let that just sit in for a minute. So for my next big project, I decided to partner with local schools and nonprofit in their community. And we identify children who were having difficulty in the classroom and even home situations in a seven to 10 week drumming program. And it was the same thing. We wanted to see if the experience would help improve behavior in the classroom. And after that, both the teachers, even the parents, came to me and said, Francis, it's amazing. Our kids have found their voice. They are able to communicate. They were able to pay attention better in the classroom. Very, very important. So I'm here to plead with you. If you're a psychologist, a neurologist, a medical doctor, a social worker, working in a community, Let's not continue in this colonial white supremacy ideology that somehow rituals and traditions that people have engaged in for thousands of years, not effective. <laughs> and I also want to make it very clear that I'm not here to condemn talk therapy and medications, no. I believe in them. They are very important to the process of healing. But true and total healing should seek to connect a person with their community, their rituals, their spirituality, their traditions, and everything that they hold so significant to them. Everything. And I know it works. It worked for the 14-year-old who experienced such tragic trauma, sat in my office and was struggling. He found his voice through rhythm. And it worked for me. Four years ago, I was sitting in a house in a beautiful suburbia liquid I just closed on to start my new life post-divorce. I was excited, I was thinking about how I was going to decorate it, how my home was going to represent who I am. Now I don't need anybody's permission to buy a certain color of couch or anything. <laughs> and, and as I thought about it, this overwhelming sense of fear and doubt just crippled me. I started asking questions. How am I going to manage the most important things in my life, my two boys that I fought 50% custody of. And because of them, I chose to stay in a neighborhood where there are only a few black people. Questions like, are you going to be able to manage your social work career, your adjunct faculty research? And I was crippled by this fear. And I remember that I always carry a djembe in my trunk. So I went out, got the djembe, and I remember my maternal 
grandfather's voice. And I started playing. And as I played and I played and I played, I felt this overwhelming doubt and sense of fear just evaporate out of my body. I just felt it. And I stepped out. And I took this new life on. And just like the 14-year-old, I rediscovered the power in the rituals and traditions that I have experienced as a child growing up. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.